All right, let's uh, pick back up where we left off last time in um, looking at Roman Catholicism. And uh, last time we talked about uh, Scripture and we talked about uh, the Trinity. I said, you know, it's basically the same, but then kind of questions and push back some. I guess their practices, it seems as though they, they worship the saints instead of worshiping God alone. So uh, today, uh, let's look at Jesus and salvation and if we have time, we'll touch on their view of the church a little bit. Uh, I may not have time to get to that in the teaching part, uh, if not, uh, or in the video part, but I'd encourage you to read that in your written material and uh, talk about any questions you would have in, in your groups. But uh, when it comes to Jesus, we've been thinking about the person and the work of Jesus with these different uh, religions. And so when it comes to the person of Jesus, Evangelicals and Catholics would, uh, you know, would really agree uh, about who Jesus is. Uh, I mean, really, our doctrinal formulations when it comes uh, to the person of Jesus uh, really come, you know, from the Roman Catholic Church and go back, you know, to fourth, fifth century those times, and they would certainly agree that Jesus is fully God and fully man. I think you could argue in, in, in practice, maybe some of the things they believe about Mary and the saints may contradict that a little bit. But, um, I mean, I think it's very clear that the doctrinal position of the church uh, is that Jesus is fully God and fully man and that we would be in a, a agreement. Now, when it comes to the work of Jesus, though, I think things, you know, get a little bit different. I mean, they would certainly affirm that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he rose from the dead. Really, they would uh, even uh, affirm, in, on, on one hand, that the, the work of the cross uh, was, was sufficient, uh, that, um, that, that it provided the satisfaction uh, for our sins. But uh, I'm going to argue and try to demonstrate in, in this material that really other things they teach actually ends up... Uh, contradicting that and that in, in reality they don't affirm that the the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins was an all efficient all sufficient satisfactory uh, sacrifice for us that like we talked about last time that it ends up being uh, grace plus uh, works faith plus works it's not Christ uh, alone and I'm going to try to give a summary uh, of the material that's in your book. And, you know, it gets fairly uh, detailed there. But uh, you, you've probably heard, if you know much about uh, Catholicism at all, about the sacraments. And uh, basically, uh, sacraments, what that word means is it's a channel of grace. So through... Uh, you know, observing a sacrament properly, God uses that sacrament itself as a channel of grace. Literally, His grace is flowing through, you know, the, the observation of that. And so uh, when we speak of, say, communion and baptism as symbols instead of sacraments, we believe that they're representing what Jesus did for us and that grace comes through what Jesus did for us uh, it, itself, not that grace is being administered or transmitted or flowing through just uh, the observance of that particular ordinance or sacrament. In, in other words, uh, when, you know, when we baptize someone here at True Life, it's to symbolize and confess Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection uh, and, and what He accomplished in, in saving them, and they're saying they're now trusting in Him. It's a symbol, nothing magical about the water. When we uh, take communion together as a church, then uh, you know, we're remembering what Jesus has done for us. We're celebrating the redemption that He accomplished. But in Roman Catholicism, they believe that through baptism itself, grace is being conveyed. Or through you know, taking the elements of communion as they become the body and blood of Jesus, that grace is being conveyed. So outwardly it's the same, but in reality it's two completely different things. And so you know, I think, and this is what I'm going to show, that this kind of thing undercuts 
the idea that the cross alone was all sufficient for our salvation. Now, in, in Roman Catholic teaching, there's seven sacraments. There's baptism, there's confession, there's Holy Eucharist, there's confirmation, there's holy orders, and that's when uh, men are ordained as deacons, priests, or, or, or bishops. There's matrimony or marriage, and there's extreme unction, which would be like the last rites for uh, the dying. Now, we're going to look at some of these and how they, in effect, functionally and practically, end up taking away from the sufficiency of the atonement of Christ. So, uh, let's talk about baptism. Um, James White writes, A person enters into a state of sanctifying grace through baptism, which the Council of Trent called the labor of regeneration. So, basically, you know, when they sprinkle a baby, or even if someone's you know, baptized at a later point in life, Basically, you know, original sin is washed away, and so a sense that person is saved, they start on kind of a journey of salvation in, in, in reality. Um, the Catholic Catechism says, by virtue of our baptism, the first sacrament of the faith, the Holy Spirit in the church communicates to us intimate, intimately and personally the life that originates in the Father and is offered to us in the Son. Uh, White goes on to say, Baptism is an absolute necessity for salvation. For as Canon 5 of the decree concerning the sacraments from the Council of Trent says, If anyone says that baptism is optional, that is not necessary for salvation, let him be anathema. And if anyone disagrees with his view of baptism, they are condemned by anathema as well. So, we believe that baptism has nothing to do with saving us in and of itself. Jesus alone saves. It's an hour confession, symbol of our salvation. It's two different faiths. That's why I said, you know, they're not the same. They say, I'm damned because I'm teaching this. I don't know that we can just all hold hands and get along and pretend like this is actually the same thing. And, and, and this is their own teachings. And so the point I'm making is this. You can't say Jesus' atonement on the cross is all sufficient for our salvation and, and, and say, no, you can't be saved without being baptized, because what that would mean is someone who is trusting in Christ and his finished work on the cross, but has not been baptized yet for some reason, is not actually saved yet. So you can't have it both ways. You can't add baptism to the cross and say the cross alone is sufficient. And that's where I want to go back last time and really what this all boils down to. Is our faith plus or is it alone? Jesus alone or is it Jesus plus other things? Okay, a, a second one of the, the sacraments that you know, shows that they're, they're not trusting in Christ alone, that that's not their doctrine, is confession. And uh, once again, uh, James White writes, the sacrament is made up of three parts, contrition, confession, and satisfaction. Contrition is the sorrow for sin. Confession, the action of confessing those sins to the priest to receive absolution for them an action that is absolutely necessary for salvation who, for anyone who would commit a mortal sin after their baptism. Uh, satisfaction is undergoing some kind of penance, normally assigned by the priest, to expiate the temporal punishments for the sins. And so uh, the Reformers, the Protestant Reformers, Martin Luther, uh, and so on and so forth, rejected the concept of Roman penance, confession, and satisfaction because they felt all of these in one way or another denied the sufficiency of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Penance because it asserts that Christ's death does not cleanse from all sin, including the temporal punishments. Confessions because, confession because it affirms the existence of a sacramental priesthood in the New Testament church. So practically there the question would be, is can I claim John 1, 9, 1 John 1.9 
uh, that says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse, all unri- cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can I claim Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 that says Jesus is my high priest? Can I confess my sins to God, go to God through Jesus and be cleansed? Or does there have to be a human priest in the middle of that? Is Jesus alone the mediator between us and God? Or is it Jesus as a mediator plus an earthly priest as a mediator? Is he sufficient? Is it Christ uh, alone? And then, and that was me inserting into his quote. So to pick back up with his quote, number three, satisfaction, because it assures uh, that man by his undergoing of some kind of penance can satisfy justice. Is the sacrament of penance where some of the most basic differences between Roman Catholicism and the biblical view espoused by the reformers can be seen? Because they said God's justice was satisfied completely, fully, and alone by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Like Romans 3.26, where when we have faith in Jesus, uh, you know, God can be just. God is just and, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Third, Holy Eucharist. The Catholic Catechism says, The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist, listen to this, are one single sacrifice. Meaning that every time the Eucharist, the, the, the elements of what we usually call communion, the Lord's Supper, are offered, that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is being repeat, repeated or re-offered. So how do we say that the cross is alone sufficient? Uh, It goes on to say the victim is one and the same. The same now offers uh, through the ministry of priest who then offered himself on the cross, only the manner of offering is different. In this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner. So how would we respond to this? Well, we just let the Bible speak for itself. Hebrews 9, 23 through 28 says, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us, Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to offer, uh, I'm sorry, then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So we believe that the cross was the once for all sacrifice that paid for all of our sins. It's not recreated or represented uh, through the mass. And then um, the, the other thing that I would point out here, it's not specifically one of the sacraments, but I think it is a way that, that certainly shows that they don't believe that the cross uh, is alone sufficient, is the idea of purgatory. I heard uh, John MacArthur say in a sermon one time, it's purgatory that really holds the whole system together. And, and based on my studies, I think he's actually right. And I think it is the ultimate proof that they do not believe in the sufficiency of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. So here's some of what the Catholic Catechism says about uh, purgatory. It says, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified. Meaning that the cross, the sacrifice of Jesus, did not perfectly and completely purify us. It says, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Now, um, you know, there, there's other quotes here in your materials that you can read. I'm not going to take the time to read all of them now. Uh, I would say there's no scriptural basis for the Apocrypha. It's mentioned in 2 Maccabees uh, and, um, 
you know, but the Bible says, Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible speaks of no intermediate state uh, like purgatory. We either go to heaven or to hell. Uh, but what, what I'm saying here that, that this demonstrates is that um, if it takes pur something like purgatory to kind of burn away, to purify, you know, whatever sin's still there, it's saying the cross wasn't enough to do that. Whereas the Bible says, uh, you know, we're perfected forever by the blood of Jesus Christ. Is it Christ alone? Is it the cross alone? That's what we believe. So we believe that the work of Jesus was sufficient. Uh, let me end this section by just sharing a few quotes from Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Uh, Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his love toward us, and while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us us. Uh, Romans 8, 1 through 3 says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, notice this, God did. God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Did he do the work or did we do the work? Did he do some of it and we do some of it? We believe it's Jesus alone, not Jesus plus. The cross is sufficient. Are you trusting in Jesus alone, his finished work on the cross to save you? Do you believe he accomplished it all? And all you have to do is trust him, rely on him and what he's done for you is your faith in Christ alone. And so... That, in, in, in particular, in this whole section then in general about the work of Christ, leads into the next section, which is about salvation. And like I said, they connect together, but this is really where the rubber meets the road with all of this. This is the crux of the Protestant Reformation. This is the key to answering the question of should evangelicals and Catholics unite together today? Or is it two different faiths? Is it different versions of the gospel? So, and here's really what it boils down to. Evangelicals and Catholics each believe that salvation is by grace through faith, but evangelicals would add the word alone. Um, so Catholics would deny, I mean, the, the first canon on justification from the Council of Trent denies that we can be saved by our own works. But, once again, I think it's a plus religion. It's faith plus works. I think we've already seen that. We're going to see it a lot more in this section. So, once again, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, the glory of God alone, the authority of Scripture alone. Catholics object to the word alone. Also, another difference here would be, you know, Catholics believe it's faith plus works, while we believe it's faith that alone, but it produces good works. That faith, in a sense, doesn't stand alone, but there's fruit that comes from the root of faith. Really, um, Roman Catholics confuse and combine salvation and sanctification. So they're connected, but really they're distinct. We're saved, and then we're being sanctified. They kind of combine it all together. So um, let's start by looking at some distinctions here and kind of framing the debate. So Martin Luther called justification by faith alone the article upon which the church stands or falls. And R.C. Sproul um, wrote of this, the logic followed by the reformers is this. Justification by faith alone is essential to the gospel. The gospel is essential to Christianity and to salvation. The gospel is essential to a church's being a true church. And to reject then justification by faith alone is to reject the gospel and to fall as a church. And so 
That's why the Protestant reformers ended up rejecting the Roman Catholic Church as a true church. And I believe that if that is true, if the, that, that you know, the, the premises here are true, that the logic holds that it's not a true church. And so, so we should uh, you know, reject it as one today. And that's what this boils down to, uh, really. So is it justification by faith or is it justification by faith uh, uh, alone. And so even to take that a, a different, uh, to just kind of a little bit of a deeper level. So Sproul says the Roman Catholic view of justification is analytical and that God declares a person to be just when justice or righteousness inheres in the subject, meaning um, that the person is actually being righteous enough through the infusion of grace that God would declare them uh, just or righteous. And th th this is why works have to be involved in salvation according to their view. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, and I don't think this is just theological nuances, it's not secondary doctrine, this is a question of the gospel, uh, you know, he says the Reformation view of justification is synthetic, meaning, to quote him, God declares a person just based on something that is, that is added, something that is not inherent in the person, the imputed righteousness of Christ. The gracious character of our justification stands out in bold relief, uh, revealing that God is both just and the justifier of those who believe. In other words, God declares us righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. He imputes, He places to our account the righteousness of Christ. So in justification, God declares someone who is unjust, unrighteous in him or herself, just and righteous through the finished work of Christ. Then, as a part of salvation is regeneration, we're given the Holy Spirit, given a new nature, then in sanctification, we actually become you know, more righteous in our practice where spiritual growth, as we've talked about as we've gone through the book of Ephesians, if you're a part of true life, is our practice more and more matching up to this righteous position. But it's the idea that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, so we have nothing to offer God. We have nothing to uh, contribute to our uh, salvation. So we have to have a righteousness then that comes from outside of us that is imputed to us the righteousness of Christ through the finished work on the cross. It's not that we can become righteous through his help plus our good works plus the sacraments that only Jesus alone can make us positionally and practically uh, righteous. Um, you know, Sproul says in the Catholic position that baptism is the primary instrumental cause uh, of justification uh, and that it is the first or initial cause of, of justification. Since the grace of justification received by baptism may be lost, the secondary instrumental cause of justification is the sacrament of penance. And he's basing that on their own writings. So uh, that would be their uh, position. You know, our position would be, and, and there's more details and some lengthy quotes that, that get into this more specifically, uh, you know, in, in, in the written work here, is that, uh, you know, justification is through Christ alone, by faith alone, and it's imputed righteousness. Now, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of theology in there. Let me boil it down to uh, some, you know, just some basic biblical affirmations that hopefully make this a little simpler and uh, uh, a little more clear. So th these are four affirmations to hang our spiritual, our theological hats on. Really, I believe our eternities hang on the, the, the truth uh, of these affirmations. So the first one is this. If we have been justified by Jesus... It is a permanently settled issue. And that's like once for all permanent. It, it's not something that can come and go. It's not a plan. It's not a process. It doesn't take a lifetime. And then getting finished off in purgatory, it happens instantaneously uh, through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
Romans 5.1 puts it this way. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that it's past tense. It's a finished, settled work. Permanently settled. So that's the first affirmation. The second affirmation is that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from good works as the ground of salvation. So I, I want to read kind of a, a lengthy quote from Scripture, with a little commentary, because of how important this is. Everything rises and falls on this, okay? So Romans 3.19 all the way through chapter 4 verse 5 says this. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, the works of the law can't save us. The purpose of the law is to show us that we're sinners in need of a Savior. The law condemns us because it shows us that we fall short. The only way to be saved by keeping the law would be to keep it 100% perfectly, and we've all failed to do that. The law is like a mirror. It's like if you're outside working all day in the yard one day, on a hot summer day, you come in, you look in the mirror. It shows that you're dirty, that you need a shower, but it doesn't clean you. You have to get in the shower uh, to get clean. And, and in that analogy, Jesus is like the shower, and the mirror is like the law. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, but now the righteousness of God, notice this, apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all, to all and on all who believe. You want the righteousness of God? He's saying, don't try to get it by keeping the law. That just shows you that you've fallen short. You do it by believing in Jesus Christ. It says, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But here's the good news. Being justified freely, which means at no cost to us because He paid the complete cost. By His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, as an atoning sacrifice, absorbing the wrath of God by His blood, through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time, His righteousness. What's the righteousness of God? That He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. When we trust Jesus, that being the only way of salvation, God is upholding His law, so He's just, but by grace, He's justifying, He's declaring righteous those of us who trust in Him. Where's boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. If it's by faith in what Jesus has done alone, he gets the glory. There's nothing we can boast in. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles only, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law as fulfilling the purpose that, of showing us that we're sinners in need of a Savior. What then shall we say that Abraham our father is found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. In other words, it's adding to what we owe God. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Affirmation number three. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, but good works are always the fruit of genuine salvation. Jesus said we're known by our fruits. You know, we quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 a lot. But verse 10 says... For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we walk in them. We're not saved by faith plus works, but real, genuine, saving faith produces good works. And then the, the fourth affirmation is that salvation is for the glory of God alone. We've talked about that a lot uh, through this. Uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty nine that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why it has to be Jesus alone. Alone is the key word, not plus 
but alone. So to finish this up, before you have your discussions, I want you to watch something that I think will uh, really be helpful to you, make this clear. It's, it's a section from uh, the American Gospel about Roman Catholicism and uh, just you know, what the people are saying, but especially the little kind of uh, you know, diagram part of this that shows the contrast and the plans of salvation. Hopefully that'll just sum all this up, make it crystal clear for you. So check that out and then discuss together. In many ways, the defining doctrine of true biblical Christianity is justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Justification is God declaring us righteous even though we are guilty of sin. We see in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works so that no man may boast. And so this is the great dividing line between biblical Christianity during the Reformation and the Roman Catholic religion. The official position of the Roman Catholic Church on justification is that they believe that you are justified by faith plus works. In fact, at the Council of Trent, which people refer to as the Counter-Reformation, they actually issued an anathema. If anybody believes that they are justified by faith alone, they are condemned under the anathema of the Council of Trent. And so the Roman Catholic Church actively was opposing and cursing those who were holding a biblical gospel. It is often called the plus religion because Catholicism teaches that you are saved by faith plus works, by grace plus merit, by Christ plus other mediators, according to scripture plus tradition, and for the glory of God as well as the glory of Mary and other saints. When you look at the Roman Catholic plan of salvation, it is a salvation of works and sacraments. In the Roman Catholic plan of salvation, baptism cleanses an infant from original sin. And that is the sacrament of regeneration as well as justification. That it starts them off on this plan, on this track. Along the way, however, they can commit these small sins, venial sins, which plunges them back down and heaven forbid they commit a mortal sin, which knocks them completely off the plan of salvation. And he must now receive sacraments. He must confess his sins to a priest, which is the sacrament of penance. And then he must be re-justified by doing good works, by doing penance. And once he is re-justified, then he must maintain his salvation through sacraments. And if, in the end, if they have enough people praying for them, and if they do enough time in purgatory, they might possibly get to heaven. How they get to heaven is based on what they do rather than what Christ has done. But the Bible teaches, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the work has been done. He saves you totally, completely, perfectly. And even though, yes, we sin and can repent, the sacrifice of Christ has paid for those sins. And so there is assurance that he has saved you, he has plucked you out of the world, you're in the palm of his hand, and nobody can pluck you out of his hand. And so that's why the reformers cried the five solas, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, all for the glory of God alone. That message has always found opposition. And the Jerusalem Council, and we read about it in the book of Acts, actually addressed this very same issue. The rabbis and the Judaizers were saying to the Christians that God will accept you by His grace through faith and your keeping of the ceremonial laws, being circumcised, washing your hands, keeping the food laws. And the entire church agreed, as summarized by uh, the Apostle Peter's statement, but that is not the good news. That's not the gospel. Jesus didn't come to make salvation possible for those who do their part. He came to accomplish it and to give it freely to all of his people. The question is, well, how do we know if faith is real, if there's no works? Doesn't the Bible say faith without works is dead? And so don't we have to do works to be saved? Isn't that the argument? Is that what we have to be doing? But there's two understandings of that, and one's biblical, one's not. 
So the Roman Catholic view of salvation, and really any works-based system of salvation, takes works and puts it at the root and says that works plus your faith in Jesus is what produces salvation. But the Bible teaches that it's not the root, it's actually the fruit, that your faith alone in Jesus, that is what saves, and then a, a life that has been saved, a sanctified, regenerated heart, produces fruit the fruit of good works. And so you know a person's been saved because of their fruit, but the fruit is not the reason they're saved. They're saved by God, by grace, through faith in Christ. You see, the Christian is the only person, the true Christian, who can say that they're going to heaven without being self-righteous. Why? In other religions, how do you get to heaven? You get to heaven by being good, by earning it. In Christianity, you're not reconciled to God through your own virtue or merit, but you're reconciled to God through the virtue and merit of His Son. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense.